Hello and welcome everyone. So grateful that you could join us today. My name is Christina Nunn and I'm the Volunteer and Outreach Coordinator with the Nova Scotia Nature Trust. As a settler of this land, I'd like to take a moment to recognize how privileged we are to work and live in Mi'kmaq, which is the unceded ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq. We give deep gratitude to the Mi'kmaq who have been the original caretakers of Mi'kmaq since time immemorial. While there's work to be done, the Nature Trust is working to build meaningful relationships grounded in respect and elevating Mi'kmaq rights and Mi'kmaq-led conservation. So I want to thank all of our wonderful volunteers that are joining us today. This is specially uh, provided to all of you. Um, I want to thank you for your support of our conservation work. Many of you are longtime volunteers and have put in a, a great deal of effort into our work. And we also want to thank you for your interest in learning more about invasive species in Nova Scotia. We also want to thank the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council and spe specifically Houston Grimshaw Surrett for their generosity in partnering with us for this event. Houston Grimshaw Surrett graduated from St. Mary's University in 2020 with a Master of Applied Science degree in biology, where he studied ways to improve green roof habitats for insect pollinators. For over four years, Houston has been instructing environmental science classes and labs at St. Mary's University. He started working with the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council in the summer of 2022 as the Invasive Species Field Technician and is now the Outreach Coordinator. He's passionate about working with communities to engage in discussions about invasive species and what we can do to protect our native biodiversity. And he's going to present uh, today and to tell you all about the invasive species in Nova Scotia. So during this presentation, I just want to let you know that we um, welcome questions via the chat and we welcome them throughout the presentation if, if you'd like. Uh, we will have time for additional discussion afterwards, uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so at the end. And uh, uh, what we will do is if you wanted to have a question, uh, just put it in the chat and then I will bring it up and Houston said he's okay with answering those as we go along. So I'll hand it over to you, Houston. Thank you again. Hello, everyone. Um, everyone's having a great day. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, as well as thank you for the invitation to come and speak today about invasive species. Um, yeah, so I might as well just get started then. So do do. another thing too, I want to mention, if I do miss any questions as we're going through the slides, um, we'll definitely get to them at the, at the end. Okay, so here's an overview. Um, so <clears throat> first off, I'm going to talk about Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council, who we are, what we do. We'll talk about invasive species, um, what they are. We'll talk about how do they get here? How do they spread? Um, we'll talk about what we can do. And I'll also talk about a few um, examples of really just a couple invasive species present here in Nova Scotia. So Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council is a provincial chapter of the Canadian Council on Invasive Species. Our goal is to raise awareness and promote a coordinated response to the threat of invasive species in Nova Scotia. Um, so we collaborate with all levels of government, NGOs, the public, and other stakeholders to provide information about invasive species. We also conduct some uh, research on the impact invasive species have on native species and examine some potential management solutions as well. We also develop and distribute resources for identification, mapping, and management on invasive species. So first off, what are invasive species anyways? Well, they, an invasive species is any organism that is non-native, spreads rapidly, and causes harm. Uh, so not all non-native species are invasive. They have to have these other categories here as well. So spreads rapidly and causes harm. Um, so when I say causes harm, um, this can whether be in terms of biodiversity, um, altering habitat, uh, being impacts on species at risk, or it could also be economical harm. So uh, whether it be a agricultural pest, a forestry pest, 
and as well as harm to human health. So those are all the different aspects of causing harm. And invasive species typically are also spread rapidly. They have weedy characteristics, meaning that uh, they typically will produce a lot of offspring. Um, they are able to able to survive in a wide variety of habitats, typically really competitive as well. So there is a lot of different uh, invasive species, and they are in many different categories of organisms. So you got many different types of animals, um, invertebrates, for example. We've got many different types of insects that are invasive, uh, crustaceans, mollusks, um, amphibians, reptiles, fish, birds, mammals, um, even small organisms such as pathogens, including bacteria, fungi, nematodes, can also be invasive species. And of course, we have plants. So this is another huge category of invasive species, including algae, ferns, mosses, gymnosperms, flowering plants. And so later on, um, I'll talk about, like I said there, I'll talk about a few examples of particular species that are an issue here in Nova Scotia. So how do they get there here in the first place? Well, there's many different pathways on how invasive species get here. Planting in gardens is a big one. Um, so whether it be ornamental or agricultural purposes, uh, these plants um, may escape gardens and become naturalized. Uh, these then can potentially cause a negative impacts on the ecosystem or economy there. Releasing unwanted pets. So if you have a pet that you can no longer care for, and instead of finding it a new home, you decide to release it into the wild, whether it be into a water system, such as goldfish, or releasing it into the forest, such as uh, bunnies and so on. So these types of organisms um, can become invasive, um, and that's just another pathway that invasive species are present in our habitat. Dumping aquarium plants as well. So instead of properly disposing of aquarium plants, uh, dumping them in water systems where then they um, will uh, basically take can potentially take over the system if they're adapted to that ecosystem. Introducing new game species, uh, so these would be intentional releases of um, animals, whether it be for hunting, for fishing. Uh, we'll, and I'll talk about the two examples uh, here in Nova Scotia later on. Commercial wood ports, so bringing wood from other regions um, into other uh, into new regions can bring pests a hitch and a ride along with these wood imports um, and shipping as well. So um, pests will hitch a ride, whether it be attaching themselves to the hull of ships or being sucked up in ballast tanks where then they are moved from one region to another. So here's these are just a, some of the pathways here that invasive species get into new habitats. Then once they get here, then how do they spread? Um, so typically the pathways of getting invasive species here are typically human uh, orientated, but once they get here, they then can spread naturally. So whether it be floating downstream or animal dispersal. So for instance, uh, multiflora rose, uh, uh, birds will eat their fruits um, and then they'll disperse the seeds around surrounding habitats via bird poop or also natural movement. So just the natural expansion of, um, of their ranges, um, which is typically a little bit uh, slower. We as humans though, we also spread invasive species um, and we typically will give them a, uh, we definitely increase the rate of spread there. And so there's many different ways. Um, one being hitch and rides on boat trailers. So for instance, if you, um, are taking your boat out of a lake system and you put your uh, trailer hitch into the water, it can collect plants. These plants are not removed after taking the uh, boat out and now you um, launch your boat at a different site. This can now introduce, though, if these are invasive species, can introduce this now into a completely new system. Ballast of water tanks. So again, I was kind of talking about that earlier where these are organisms that are sucked up into these ballast tanks. Seeds stuck in the hiking uh, boot treads. So if you go for a hike, 
um, or a walk summers where there is invasive species present and you get seeds lodged into the treads, um, typically associated with muck as well. Then you move to a new area without cleaning this off. This can introduce this invasive species into a new um, region. And very similar to seeds stuck in tire treads. So this is just a very similar concept here, but um, in regards to vehicles, seeds stuck to your dog as well as clothing articles. So many invasive species have their fruit or seeds adapted to cling onto fur um, to allow them to get farther away from their parent plant. And um, if you don't clean these off, moving between different habitats or regions, you can introduce now a new species into that region. Moving forward is another example. Um, so a many a forestry pests will hitch a ride on firewood um, and we give them an extra leap in their range by moving it from one, rain, uh, one region to another and not cleaning off recreational equipment. So if, uh, for example, not cleaning off boats, uh, moving between lake systems. So what is the impact of invasive species? Well, it is widely accepted that invasive species are a huge threat to biodiversity worldwide. In Canada alone, more than 20% of our species at risk are threatened with extinction by invasive species. And so they do this by predating on native species and taking their food and space, um, by contributing to soil degradation and erosion, as well as degrading water quality and habitat. And invasive species can also introduce new diseases. And some may actually have adverse health effects on human health. And invasive species alter infrastructure as well and can come at quite a significant economical cost. Um, and this could whether it be as well in terms of impacts on forestry, agriculture, fishing industries, as well as reducing um, recreational opportunities. So needless to say, um, these organisms can have huge impacts on the ecosystem that they're present in. So next, I'm going to go through a few examples of invasive species here in Nova Scotia that are of a particular threat. This is just a very small sample um, of invasive species here. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the green crab. So the green crab is a small shore crab found in shallow water, generally in sheltered areas. Um, it is common in salt marshes, on sandy beaches, and on rocky coasts and can tolerate a wide range of salinities, making it quite a good invasive uh, species. Adults can reach about 10 centimeters, and they have serrated shells with three spines between the eyes. So looking at this uh, image here, you can see the three spines between the eyes, and then they have uh, five spines on each side. So you can, again, see the five spines here. Um, and they also have a pointed uh, flattened back uh, legs. So these guys threaten marine and estuarine ecosystems as they're very aggressive predators that feed on a wide variety of intertidal animals, including oysters, mussels, clams, and juvenile crabs. The green crab will outcompete uh, native crab species for resources, such as food and space as well. Uh, Green crabs can destroy beds of bivalves, and most notably, uh, disrupt eelgrass beds, which are important habitat for many juvenile fish. And so this can cause, this causes significant impact, reducing biodiversity. This loss, um, will in con ah, sorry, um, this loss is also very harmful in terms of fishing and aquaculture industries um, due to the impacts that they can have there. So these guys are native to Europe and North Africa. They arrived first in North um, America around 1817, and it's believed that they were carried in the holds of wooden ships. Um, green crabs are believed to have spread, thought to have believed, <laughs> thought to have spread mostly through ballast um, water transfers or drifting through ocean currents during their larval stage, which is up to 90 days. 
<clears throat> introduction and spread via fishing gear and movements and discards is also possible. So if a fisherman pulls up um, green crab and does not get rid of the bycatch in that particular area and moves it to another area, you're now uh, increasing the, the, the range of the green crab. And this species is found along the coast of Nova Scotia from Cape Breton to the South Shore. So next I'm going to talk about uh, two more aquatic species, and these two are the ones I was referring to that are intentional uh, releases there. Um, so small mouth bass are freshwater fish with brown to green body and a white belly. They have a spiny back fin, as you can see here, and their sides have a dark blotchy vertical bars, and their head has several dark horizontal bars. In this image, it's a little bit harder to make out, but in the next slide there, I have a um, illustration which shows it a little bit better. So these guys inhabit uh, the smallmouth bass habitat includes lakes, streams with rocky bottoms and plenty of shade. Um, these guys are very efficient predators of many smaller fish, mammals, and amphibians. Not only does it eat native species, but it also consumes much of the food which native uh, fish require for survival. So there's also competitive pressures there. Um, so they were spread by intentional introduction. This was an authorized release in 1942 in Bunkers Lake in Yarmouth County, which is sanctioned by the government for sport fishing. And so since then, uh, they have spread uh, throughout the, the province, so both smallmouth bass and chain perkle, the next species I'll be talking about. Um, and these threatened native fish communities are more than half of the primary watersheds in Nova Scotia. So the next fish I'll be talking about is chain pickerel. This is a freshwater torpedo shaped fish with a green body and a darker back and white belly. Adults have a chain like pattern on their sides. Um, as you can see in this photo here. Um, and so this is where they get their name, chain pickerel. And so these guys inhabit a shallow vegetated ponds, lakes, and sluggish streams. They are ferocious predators and are known to consume anything that is smaller in size um, to them. And so not only do they alter ecosystems, which causes havoc for native biodiversity, but they also negatively impact traditional sport fishing opportunities, as once they get into a lake system, they can decimate the native fish populations. And so these guys as well, so these were introduced uh, fish species in Nova Scotia, um, initially was planted in three lakes in 1945, and now has spread to 95 known locations within the province. And this has been through um, additional illegal movements of live fish and or um, dispersal within the watersheds themselves. So through connected rivers and so on, where they're able to move throughout. Okay, so moving on um, from the fish, we are now going to talk about some insects. So the first insect pest I'm going to talk about is the hemlock woolly adelgid. And so this is an aphid-like uh, insect that infests hemlock trees. It gets its namesake from the egg sacs that look like white wool at the base of the hemlock um, needles. And so it's pretty uh, diagnostic of this organism by observing these at the base there of the needles. And they feed on the nutrients and water storage cells at the base here. This causes needle loss, stem dieback, and can kill hemlocks in four to 20 years. Infected trees will bud prematurely, lose their needles, and the crown turns this gray to yellow, dull green color. Um, and so this is a particular, a really significant concern as hemlocks play a very important role in the environment. And losing these trees can be, have a devastating impact on vegetation, birds, mammals, and aquatic organisms. So hemlock woolly delgid is native to Asia and it was first detected in Nova Scotia in 2017. So this is a relatively newer um, 
invasive species present in the province. It was though first reported in North America um, in Eastern United States and Virginia in 1951, where it was likely brought over um, an infested nursery stock from Japan. It has since spread and is now found east from northern Georgia to the coastal Maine and southwestern Nova Scotia. And so while hemlock willy deltrid is a dental threat to hemlocks across the province, there's a particular concern uh, for rare old growth hemlock forests in Kejimakujik National Park. And so scientists are reaching, uh, researching, I mean, multiple different options here uh, to help save our hemlocks from this pesky little insect. And so some methods may include chemical treatments such as insecticides, um, silviculture, which would in, um, be the selective cutting of hemlocks to allow more sunlight to reach the trees, uh, which may increase their resistance. Biological control, such as introducing natural predators of the adelgid, and even um, identifying and breeding hemlocks that are genetically resistant um, to this pest. And so hemlocks are not currently listed as endangered, but we definitely want to be proactive and make sure that you all get there, as this insect has the potential to do this. So the next insect I'll be talking about is the emerald ash borer. This is uh, an invasive beetle that is a pest of ash trees. It's about half an inch long and has a very metallic green coloration um, for the adults. The larvae are flat and white um, and can actually grow double the size of the adult. And so adults will emerge um, from the bark, um, from the tree, um, creating these D-shaped uh, holes, so shown here. So this is pretty um, diagnostic of the presence of emerald ash borer. Um, it's, we have other species that will create holes, but not this D-shaped hole. So this is a unique characteristic and something to look out for, for the presence of um, emerald ash borer. The larvae too, when they're feeding on the inner layers of the bark, they create these serpentine-like feeding patterns, which again is quite unique um, in terms of uh, other species, uh, in comparison to other species we have here. <clears throat> and so once a tree is infested, the tree will normally die after two to three years. So it does not take long for this um, insect to kill uh, ash trees. It does this by um, girdling the trees and preventing the flow of nutrients between the roots and the leaves and vice versa. Um, and so the mortality rate as well is nearly 100%. So it's it's a significant threat um, to our ash trees. And so the loss of ash trees can be devastating to forest habitats, affecting tree species composition and, and nutrient cycling. Ash trees provide important resources for numerous species, including insects, birds, and mammals. And so this guy was first detected in North America in 2002, and since then is estimated to have killed millions of trees across the United States and Canada, with billions more being threatened with infestation and death. Um, the emerald ash borer is native to East Asia. Um, and it's likely to have arrived to North America on wood packaging materials. So this species was found in Bedford, um, Nova Scotia in 2018. So again, another relatively recent species. And um, the most common wood way that this species uh, spreads is the movement through inf uh, infested wood. And so that's one thing that we are definitely trying to get people not to do is uh, moving infest, uh, wood that could potentially be infested with it so that the spread does not increase to the province. Okay, so the next group of um, organisms we're gonna talk about is some different examples of plants. So giant hogweed, um, this is a very large plant um, native to Europe and Asia and was first introduced to North America as a garden ornamental. It is very highly uh, invasive. It has very bold tropical looking leaves 
with a white clustered flowers growing in an umbrella shape. Um, and so this species can actually grow 1.5 to 5 meters tall. So it's a, it's a huge plant. Um, and it's, so yeah, so whoops, didn't mean to skip ahead there. <clears throat> yeah, so this plant has escaped cultivation. Um, this plant is also a threat to human health as the hogweed sap has toxins that can cause severe dermatitis um, when exposed to UV rays. It creates burns that are very similar in looks to third degree burns. And if the sap gets in eyes, it can even cause permanent blindness. So if you ever come in contact with a species it, in terms of their sap, it's definitely recommended to pay a hospital trip. And so they also, though, have an impact on the ecosystem that they're present in. So they can cause erosion in stream banks. Um, they don't have very good root systems. So um, it can, and because they can just take over and invade ravines and stream banks, it can cause a lot of er erosion here and also reduces the amount of suitable habitat available for native plants as well as wildlife. These are also very, um, high, highly invasive because of a few reasons. One being the fact that they produce so many seeds. A um, single plant can produce 50,000 to 100,000 wing uh, seeds that are dispersed via air, uh, by wind. And as well as they can persist in the soil for up to 15 years. So not only um, do they produce a lot of seeds, they stay around for a long time. Uh, it was intent intentionally planted in Bedek and since then um, has spread throughout the province. There's several known locations in Nova Scotia. So next one is dog strangling vine. Um, and so this is a group of species. So there's two that belongs, um, when we say dog strangling vine that belong to this. So this is pale swallowwort and black swallowwort. They um, are very similar in appearance. The only difference is the flowers. So for instance, this one right here is pale swallowwort. It's got more of a pinkish color to the flowers, while black um, swallowwort has a much darker, like a dark purple to black coloration. And we have both of these species present in Nova Scotia. So arrived in uh, North America uh, from Ukraine by horticulturalists to be used as vines um, in public and recreational gardens. And they're primarily spread through natural processes, such as wind dispersal. Um, they produce uh, pods that are kind of, they are within the milkweed family. And so they produce um, airborne uh, seeds that can spread at quite a distance. So what is the impacts? Well, they have a significant impact on plant biodiversity. They create um, these dense mats as they're a vine that twines. And so they will twine on each other if they don't have anything to grasp to get at a greater height. If there's other plants there, they'll twine around those plants. Um, they'll also uh, twine around any, basically any structure creating these dense mats. Um, this here is an image of one of the sites in Kentville. Um, and you can see how dense the dog strangling vine is. So it's basically all of these uh, bud, uh, broadleaf leaves here. And it's also growing quite high as well. So it's under a sumac canopy and you, it's growing, it was above my height, so over six feet high, uh, twining around the, uh, the uh, trees there. And yeah, so they also produce a lot of seeds. So another thing that aids to their invasiveness. They're also toxic. Um, insects and other herbivores will avoid dog strangling vine populations. And they also will actually secrete chemicals from their roots that impede the growth of other plant species. So it's a really uh, nasty um, invasive species. And as well, as a, has a threat to our endangered monarch butterfly. Um, so monarch larvae are specialists on milkweeds. However, there's field evidence that suggests that monarchs will actually lay their eggs on dog strangling vine. Um, and if they do, the larvae will not develop fully and will not really uh, reach maturity. And so you can lose a whole generation there. 
of the monarchs. So here is a map showing the distribution in North America. It is a particular huge pest um, in southern Ontario. Um, and you can see now it's starting to creep over here into the Atlantic provinces. So here in Nova Scotia, we're pretty lucky in the sense that there's only two known populations of a dog strangler vine. And so each of these is one of the species. So we've got one species in Wolfville and one in uh, Dartmouth. It's one of the species that we have been working with um, in terms of trying to control it. We've done a lot of work in terms of uh, outreach in the communities and as well as particularly the one in the Kenfell. And um, yeah, the goal with this one is hopefully to eradicate it before it can spread throughout the province. So the final plant that I'll be talking about is Phragmites. And so Phragmites, also known as common reed, um, is a perennial wetland grass that can grow up to five meters in height. Here though, in Nova Scotia, we don't tend to see that height. Um, there's usually around two to three meters um, maximum height there. It's uh, native to Eurasia and was introduced to North America in the 1800s by seeds and soil ballasts or by horticultural trade. The earliest record in Canada is in Annapolis Royal, um, so here in Nova Scotia, in 1910. It's believed to have arrived into this region actually by a circus train where the, the bedding for the animals was um, this species, and it's believed to escape there. Um, and there's a substantial large stands um, in the area. It also has a unique uh, name um, in Annapolis Royal, uh, elephant grass. That's um, what residents call it there. Um, it's not actually called that anywhere else. It's just kind of a neat uh, tidbit there. And so this species spreads through underground rhizomes. Um, uh, stands can spread very rapidly, um, about over a meter per year. And it can spread, though, at greater distance by being uh, fragmented rhizomes, above ground stolons, as well as seeds. So it tends to move along highway systems or uh, where there's construction or vehicles that will move it along. So what are the impacts? Well, it has a huge impact on biodiversity. It creates um, monospecific specific, uh, stands um, where no other species really can compete. It is so huge. It is very dense. The denseness also prevents many species uh, of animals being able to move through it. Um, and so reducing habitat quality of wetlands. And also impacts ecosystem function of wetlands because this is such a large grass species and has such large uh, rhizomes, it actually will elevate the wetland over time, reducing the water levels um, from increased sediment buildup in that huge uh, rhizome uh, mass. And it will also basically create an even topography of the wetland. So it'll fill in any um, ponds or pool systems. And it has huge economical costs. Um, it is estimated in 2019 that the province of Ontario spent 3.1 million on detection, prevention, and control measures of the species. This grass species can invade agricultural fields, impending um, farming practices, and block drainage ditches. Uh, stands can grow along roadways and damage asphalt through rhizome growth, and it can also block sight lines. So in areas where this species grows up to five meters in height, that can be definitely a safety risk for along highways. So here's the distribution in North America. Um, it is very much an issue in Ontario as uh, in Ontario as well as in um, eastern United States. And so in the recent years, uh, in the summer, should I say, of 2022, we did a survey in Kespuik uh, region for Phragmites. And so these were highway surveys as this species tends to move along on highways um, and so we looked at the 100 series highways, trunk routes, and collector routes, and to try to see what the populations of Phragmites are like in Nova Scotia. 
so it hasn't really been worked on before. And so we set out to look at iNaturalist and Canadian Biodiversity Information Facility, unknown records, to see if they were still there or not. And so we took measurements and coordinates were recorded. In total, um, we found 52 stands um, from these surveys. And so 34 of the previous known 79 stands were confirmed. The other remaining ones, um, whether they may have been duplicate observations, misidentified, or historical observations where there's been development, or we just couldn't find it, whether it be from the coordinates um, just not being right or something like that. And we found 18 new stands. So what do we do in terms of getting rid of invasive species? Well, eradication, um, it is very expensive. Um, it is also very time, can, it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. And so here is the, we call it invasion curve. And, and so it shows after introduction of an invasive species, um, over time, you the range and the severity of increases. Um, and so as you go on, the area infested increases, which also the control costs increases as well. So here at uh, Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council, we have two um, full-time members, me and our council supervisor. So we tend to focus on species down here, as well as more behavior changing aspects, which I'll talk about in a second, um, to prevent species from being introduced in the first place, as once they get down over here, eradication and the removal of species is very, uh, takes a lot of time and takes a lot of money. Um, so for instance, the work that we've been doing on dog strain of vine, this we're very much in the early introduction stage. So we're trying to make sure that um, it can be eradicated and does not spread any farther. Examples of species that would be up here would be for uh, Japanese knotweed. So this species is prevalent to the entire province. It would require a lot of money, a lot of time to fully eradicate it. And really only local control and management is an option there. And so what can we do? So we focus, like I was saying, on prevention, early detection, rapid response, and management of invasive species um, when they are early detected. So how do we do this? Uh, so one of the things that we focus a lot of our attention to is behavior or behavior change programs, which are to encourage people to change the way they go about their recreational activities or hobbies to help prevent the spread of invasive species. So the first one is clean, drain, dry. Um, and so boaters, anglers, and hunters and divers might unintentionally spread invasive species from one body of water to another. Um, and so this program is targeting towards this. So it's to make sure to clean plants, animals, and mud uh, from your boats in gear. Um, so this would include visually inspecting boats, trailers, and gear to remove anything you find and dispose of it in a trash or in land far from the water. Drain, so this would be drain all water from the boats and gear onto land. Empty all internal compartments, ballast tanks, live wells, villages, bait, buckets, motors, and so on, as well as pull uh, drain plugs. It is even just a small amount of water can uh, move invasive species from one system to another. And then the dry part is there just to make sure that your gear is completely dried before launching it into a new body of water. Burn local, I mean, buy local, burn local, it's another uh, program. And so this is to try and counter the, the introduction of pests from moving firewood from one location to another. Um, many forestry pests, for example, uh, move this way. So emerald ash borer, for example, is one. Um, as we will very quickly um, increase its range of the province um, if we, uh, by uh, transporting it by ourselves. 
So the idea behind this is to buy firewood at or near where you will use it and leave any used firewood on site. Then we have play, clean, go. And so this idea is to clean gear before entering a recreational site um, as well as after, um, as well as before you leave. So remove plants, insects, and mud from your boots, gear, and pets. Check bike tires um, as well as ATVs and remove any plant parts from before moving to a new area. And clean gear before leaving a recreational site. As many invasives can hitch a ride on us. So for example, here, here's two photos of how plants um, have adapted their fruits or seeds to um, stick onto fur to move farther away from the parent plant. And it's really important to make sure you remove these before moving um, into a new area. We're also working with um, setting up boot brush stations. So these are stations to brush off your boots before and after um, you get to a site. Don't Let It Loose is another program we have. Um, it's to discourage the release of pets into the wild as many become invasive um, when released. And so some common released pets include goldfish, turtles, bunnies, and other plants include fanwort, yellow iris, flying rush, frog bites, and yellow floating heart. So it's super important um, to find these guys a new home rather than releasing them into the wild. Then our final program is PlantWise. And so this is a program that supports the horticultural industry's transition to becoming invasive free. Um, and is helping gardeners in an industry understand which plants are invasive and harmful to our communities and to make plant-wise choices. So the program um, aims to educate gardeners, gardener retailers, nurseries, growers in the landscape industry to understand what invasive plants are, um, why are they a problem, and what can we do to prevent the spread, stop buying and selling invasive plants, promote the sale and purchase of non-invasive alternative plants, and control and replace invasive plant species, dispose of unwanted plants or plant material properly. So we are actually currently in the works of creating a Grow Me Instead guidebook um, so we'll include many common invasive species or species that could potentially become invasive um, and off offer alternatives um, to native species to be used instead that would fit a similar uh, garden niche. And so before I end these, uh, the talk here and then open up the questions, um, I want to make note of iNaturalist. So we use iNaturalist quite a bit. Um, we use it for research purposes. So for instance, with Phragmites, we use uh, iNaturalist sightings to know and give us a head start of where to look for populations of invasive species. It also is super good for in terms of finding new species that may be present so we can uh, develop a rapid response to a new invasive species. So it's super important to report your observations um, to iNaturalist if you think you may have seen an invasive species. We have a program set up on iNaturalist so that when you do make an observation, it gets automatically added to our invasive species database. So here's just some key takeaways. So invasive species can be devastating to biodiversity, harmful to people, and expensive to control. Invasive species are extremely difficult to remove once established. Um, prevention slash reduction of the spread is best management option. Humans play an important role in the spread of invasive species. Therefore, we play an important role to stopping them. So I want to say thank you um, for the invitation to speak today and talk about some invasive species. If you guys want to sign up for our newsletter, um, feel free to visit our website. The link can be found there. And if you guys have any questions, obviously we'll talk about a few right now, but if there's anything that comes up in the future, feel free to send me email at the link uh, provided there. Well, that was fantastic, Houston. Thank you so much. That no was problem. A, a really wonderful presentation and uh, a lot of great information there and hopefully empowering to people in a way as well so that there's some, some key steps that uh, are positive as well with going, mm -hmm. going forward. 
Um, and so for many of you who are joining us on the call today, um, our property guardians or volunteers that understand that um, invasive species are something that our stewardship team does have to deal with on a fairly regular basis. Um, some of the big ones that we you know, particularly you probably heard more recently about HWA, Hemlock, Hemlock Woody, Adelgid. Um, so this is very timely and we really appreciate the information. And I think I see our first question. So I'm just gonna see if I can open that up there. Oh, okay, a loaded question from Jacques perhaps, but um, how does this, does climate change play into your organization's strategies, feature plans and approaches or tactics? Yeah, it's it's definitely something we definitely consider. Um, so for example, uh, Phragmites, this species has been in the province for a long time. Um, in Canada, it's been like, it was introduced here at first, but it hasn't really been an issue here in Nova Scotia. Um, we're not entirely sure exactly why, but we believe that climate change may be a factor. Um, for instance, seed dispersal was never a thing for this species. Prior to, it was just by fragments. So taking into consideration climate change, like research in things um, and applying it to what species may be of a particular focus, it's definitely something we consider. Perfect. Thank you so much. I hope that answers your question, Jacques. Yeah. Just please feel free to follow up there. All right. Are there any other questions that anyone had for uh, for Houston? No? Okay. Well, I will put it out there that I think that you all have um, that you all have his uh, contact information and the Nova Scotia in Invasive Species Council information. I would also like to let you know that if you have a question specific. Oh, I see someone raised their hand, Jenny. Let's see if I can uh, I can give you permission to speak. If you wanted to type your question in the chat, that would be great. I'll see if I can give you permission now to speak as well. Let's see, allow to talk. I'll allow you to talk there, Jenny. Let's see if that works. So you can go ahead, Jenny, if you wanted to ask a question. Is goat weed from the garden considered an invasive species? Yeah, goat weed definitely is an invasive species. It's a really problematic one too. It's really hard to uh, get rid of. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> yeah, I actually I know someone who makes smoothies with it. That's her. Oh, that's her. Uh, she has it growing in her yard, and she said, "I'm just going to consume it." <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's okay, nutrition wise, so are you? So, so second question is: if you have a stand of Japanese, what do you call knotweed. it? Knotweed. Mm -hmm. What is the best way to at least prevent it from spreading further? Um, yeah, so that's another one that's really difficult to control because um, like even complete eradicate, like to remove it from a habitat is really difficult. Um, to keep it back, it's one of those things that like, you probably would have to tackle the whole thing um, to keep it contained to one area is going to be really difficult um mowing for example some there's like keeping it down um but like the new shoots that are popping up but you just continually be growing it'll be growing back as it's getting the nutrients um from the already biomass that's present so yeah it's hard to i don't really have any exact recommendations in terms of but like reducing it other than just trying to get rid of it completely but that's going to take quite a few years of intensive management to remove it okay thank yeah. you no problem I'm sorry i can't really it's, it's just one of those species yeah. really hard to control thank you, thank you jenny and thank you houston um, we have a question from Mary via the, 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 the chat, and she is asking, is Norway maple an invasive, mm -hmm. and if so, why? Yeah, Norway maple is an invasive species. Um, it is, one, it um, actually releases chemicals from its root that inhibit the growth of other plant species. So you won't see many plants growing underneath it, this species can escape into forest ecosystems, which then will compete with native species, um, tree species, for example. And then you see less amount of vegetation underneath the trees. And so you can get increased erosion as well. So that's that would be why it's considered invasive. 
are typically associated more around urban areas where they've been planted, but they are, they do have, they can move into forest systems that are close to urban areas. Thank you, Mary. If that didn't answer your question completely, please feel free to, to pop in an additional comment. So I see that we have another hand raised. So Anne, I'm oh, I'm going to get back to you, Mary, if that's okay. Um, I'm just giving permission here. Anne had a question. Yeah, and sorry, I tried to put it in the chat, but my chat is disabled for some reason. Noticing um, in the city, um, I lived cl closer to downtown Dartmouth, the, um, the park areas around me, the, um, you know, I think the city would have contractors, you know, mow the grasses, but I noticed that the contractors, whoever's mowing grasses in, um, you know, unplanted park-like areas would mow around, you know, they would, they, it's almost like they treated the um, Japanese knotweed like a desired plant, you know, when they should have been mowing into it and mm -hmm. not um, letting it grow. Has there been any, do you know, uh, if there's been any talk with the city about, you know, in getting their contractors to not uh, treat things like that, to not, you know, allow things like that, more room. Yeah, it's, we try, like there is through outreach and stuff, we, we do, we do work closely with HRM. Um, oh, good. It's, it's one of those things too, that it's like, there's quite a few contractors out there, but when we, yeah. we try to the best of our ability to make sure that people are aware of that, like, for instance, Japanese knotweed is not something you want to, you know, have as a exactly. ornamental species present there. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, we try um, to <laughs> <laughs> let our, everyone know, as many people know as possible. Right, yeah. Also, I just, I moved out to, or if I can have another question, but um, Christina, maybe there's somebody else who wants to ask a question. If you want to go ahead, since you're already talking, and then I do have to go back to Mary when you're done. Okay, um, I moved out to Coal Harbor and I'm near a trail and I noticed a lot of glossy buckthorn on the trail. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, I thought about contacting the Coal Harbor Parks and Trails Association. Is that the route I should go? Should I, um, you're probably aware of lots of glossy buckthorn, but um, do you have any ideas as to what I should do? Um, you, yeah, you can definitely uh, contact them. Um, we we also have like if you want to send us an email about the location or post it to iNaturalist just so we have a location of it. Uh, glossy buckthorn, for example, we do we do know of like a location. So off the top of my head, I don't know if that's one of the spots that we know of. Um, uh -huh. But yeah, it's wouldn't be a bad thing just to kind of shoot us an email, um, or you can just uh, post us if you have or use iNaturalist, you can post it there too. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Okay, and we're back to Mary for a moment. Um, so Mary has a couple more questions, and she's asking, is sycamore maple an invasive? It also escapes into forest lands and English ash. Yeah, so sycamore maple, we definitely consider as invasive. It's uh, both uh, Norway maple and sycamore maple are ones that we've included in our Grow Me Instead guidebook. Um, so we'll they, we definitely consider those ones to be invasive. Um, English ash is one that I'm personally not super familiar with in terms of the invasive qualities on that. I can definitely look it up if it's something you're interested in me checking out. Um, but off the top of my head, I, I'm not 100% sure on that. Mary, maybe if you wanted to send uh, Houston an email or, or me, and I can, I'm happy to forward if you didn't happen to catch his uh, email address. Uh, We'll, we'll try to get the information for you. Yeah. Perfect. Fantastic. Are there any other questions that anyone has? Okay. Well, it sounds like it was a really uh, interesting and productive um, session for everyone. So again, I want to thank you, Houston, and the Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council, and particularly all of our volunteers uh, who joined us today. We appreciate you all so very much, and uh, we hope to be able to provide more opportunities for interesting talks with our partners or people like this that can uh, can help to provide some, some more uh, information and value to you um, as you go about your volunteer work, but just also in your personal life, in your gardens, and your homes, and that's really cool. so. Um, I want to thank you all again, and uh, I hope that you all have a have a great day and uh, and have some are armed with some new information as we go forward. Yeah, thank okay. you so much as well. Um, thank, thank you for the invitation, and thank you as well for all the great questions. 
Thank you, everyone. I'm going to end the meeting now. I hope that you have a lovely rest of your day. Take care. Bye.